So good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to this uh, May Acting for Justice Gathering. My name is Jack Jezreel, and I serve on the staff of Just Faith Ministries. I'm very glad you could join us tonight. And as always, let's begin our evening in prayer. Tomorrow, of course, is Earth Day, and we anticipate it uh, with this reflection. I, I found this on the website of the, um, the Catholic Health Association. So let us pray. God of dust from which we come, in the silence of contemplation, help us hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor as one cry, uni unified and amplified. May we hear the cry of your creation calling out to be seen from every corner. May our practice of deep listening bring us to see all those creatures whose dignity is routinely ignored, that in our seeing, we might be moved from indifference to compassion, from domination to collaboration, from mastery over to harmonious coexistence. Mother of God, Mother God of land and sea, source of all that is, we pray for our practice of silence to bring us deeply into a compassionate relationship with the earth, our common home, and with each of the interconnected ecosystems which contribute to the delicate web of our livelihood. Gracious giver of all life, as our contemplation leads us to compassion, may that compassion be the breath of every action we take. Let us glorify the sacredness of both the natural world and the world's poor, that your resplendence may radiate. In your name we pray, amen. Again, welcome everybody. Uh, Leela is uh, traveling this evening, so my colleague Susan Chapman is handling all, the, all things tech tonight. And I wanted to fill you in on just a few details before I introduce tonight's speaker. First, as you probably have already noticed, you were automatically muted when you joined the event, and this is to reduce the prospect of inadvertent background noise. So after our presentation tonight, there will be a chance for you to submit questions to our speaker during the Q&A session. You may send your questions to me in the chat. Just look for the chat button on the top or bottom of your screen, and you can type your question in the appropriate box. Second, uh, this is a big week for Just Faith Ministries. We just released the third of three programs dedicated to eco-justice. This one is entitled Sacred Water, Oceans, and Ecosystems. It joins our Sacred Land and Sacred Air programs in the trilogy. So go to our website and click on Programs to find out more about our new program. Finally, and to remind you, those of you who are regulars, all of you can expect to receive a recording of tonight's event in a follow-up email next week. Feel free to share the recording with whomever you like. And again, thank you for joining us this evening. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's presenter. Avery Davis Lamb is co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries, which educates, equips, and mobilizes communions, denominations, congregations, and individuals to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. Avery has a background in both ecological research and faith-based environmental organizing, studying ecology in various ecosystems and organizing faith communities across the country in support of action on environmental justice. He's previously worked for Sojourners and Interfaith Power and Light. He serves on the board for the Center for Spirituality and Nature and is a fellow with the Regenerate program at Wake Forest Divinity School and the Foundations of Christian Leadership program at Duke Divinity School. Avery has a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Sustainability from Pepperdine. Currently, he's at Duke, uh, pursuing a Master of Environmental Management in Ecosystem Science and Conservation, and a Master of Theological Studies. I would also like to add that Creation Justice Ministries 
is a program partner with Just Faith Ministries, providing significant assistance in the construction of the three eco-justice programs I mentioned earlier. So, it is my pleasure now to, to welcome Avery to our gathering. Avery, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Jack. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And it's a gift to be a partner with you in the work that you are doing at Just Faith. I uh, just to second Jack's encouragement to please check out those sacred water resource that was just released. Um, I've seen it and it's, it's wonderful. We were able to play a role in pulling it together. And of course, like all of the Just Faith, Faith resources it is a, a, a transformative program. It's so good to be here with you all tonight. Happy Earth Day Eve. Tomorrow is Earth Day, so we're on the cusp of that. Um, my name again is Avery Davis Lamb. Um, just to go over a little bit about how the flow of the program will go tonight, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about Creation Justice Ministries and what it means to do creation justice, a little bit of our work. And then I'll turn to... Uh, to talk a little bit about the theme for the tonight, which is weathering the storm, faithful climate resilience. Weathering the storm is our Earth Day theme for this year. And so we're encouraging congregations to think about climate resilience in their community. And I'll share a few ways that you can go and integrate faithful climate resilience in your congregation or community after this program. So I'm going to share my screen to get us started here. Um, if anyone wants to jot down my contact info that's available here, I'll also add on the last slide, so no rush. But it's also pretty simple, Avery at creationjustice.org. So if for any reason you want to reach out after this program, you are welcome to. I also want to start off a little bit with my eco-autobiography. I think that it's important for us to, to ground our conversations about climate change, about the environment, in our experiences, because we all have a different story to share about how we relate to creation, how we relate to the environment. Um, so you got my, my resume, my CV from Jack already. There's a little bit, a little bit of that outlined here, but what I really wanna share is what lies beneath my CV, why I come to do this work. I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, uh, in a, a very religious church and household. Um, part of the Southern Baptist tradition, um, and was a very religious kid. And, and I was also a huge nature lover growing up. And yet, throughout my childhood, my spiritual life in nature, as I've come to see it now, was separate from my religious life. We never talked about nature in church, except for maybe when we read the Psalms. And I never really considered that my reason for loving to garden with my mom um, was because of my love of God. Like many young adults, I went off to college, went off to Pepperdine, like Jack said, and began to see how Christianity, as I was taught it, was not addressing the needs of creation that I saw around me. So I was in Southern California which as we've seen the, the last couple of years has become one of the front lines of the climate crisis. And I was seeing firsthand the effects of climate change, of intensifying wildfires, of sea level rise, of large scale extinction events that were happening in the Santa Monica Bay, just under a mile from where I was. And this came to a head when I was at a, a, a big evangelical conference in Kansas City. And I, I looked around at this conference and realized, you know, no one here is talking about care for God's creation as part of the Christian mission, as, as part of our role as caretakers. That there was a lot of conversation about other social issues, but creation care, creation justice was not a part of that. And so I, I left that conference with a call on my life, with a real desire to find the thinkers and the writers and the activists who were connecting their Christian faith with care for our world. And of course, found 
so many, so many folks in the Christian tradition who have come before and, and done this, you know, finding Wendell Berry and Howard Thurman uh, and Jurgen Moltmann um, and Ellen Davis, who I've studied with at Duke. Um, and of course, in more recent years, the work of Pope Francis and Laudato Si. And that really launched me into this world of faith-based environmental organizing. And, you know, I, I, I feel so compelled by the Christian story of incarnation, of resurrection, of, of transformation of death, of life through death, that all of that is so deeply related to care for creation. So since then, I, like Jack said, I, I've worked in several different settings of organizing faith communities around both climate change and care for God's creation, which has brought me to creation justice ministries. So Jack already read this, so I won't belabor it, but just to share again, creation justice ministries mission, I want to, I want to note that um, we work to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. So we are a, a multi-issue ecumenical environmental organization. We were actually formed out of the National Council of Churches. Um, so we were originally formed in 1983 as the eco-justice program of the National Council of Churches. So we've been around in some form for about 40 years. And we work in ecumenical collaboration with 38 national faith bodies, including Protestant denominations and Orthodox communions, as well as regional faith groups and congregants. We work very closely with Catholic groups as well, like Catholic Climate Covenant and the Laudato Si movement. Here are um, our denominational members. Um, I thought this might be interesting to some of you to see just the broad swath of traditions that Creation Justice Ministry rep represents, ranging from mainline to historically Black denominations to Orthodox communions. So you might be getting to this point um, and say, that's interesting, Avery, that's great, but what is creation justice? What does that mean? Maybe you've heard of creation care. Um, maybe you've heard of creationism. <laughs> obviously not that, but what, what do we mean by creation justice? Well, there's, what I want to share about that is when we use the word creation, what we're trying to invoke is a particular way of seeing the world. But when we see the world as creation, it counters the, the dominant scripts around us that tell us that the world is just a resource to be exploited, this language of natural resources. That no, as Christians, we, we see the world as more than that. It's, it's a gift. It is creation. It's something to be loved, cherished, and cared for. And yet it's also not something that is separate from humanity. The world is not a wilderness. The environment is, is not a wilderness where, um, you know, human contact is only something to be avoided. But creation, as we learn in Genesis 2, when God picks up the soil and breathes the breath of life into that soil, creating that first human creature, Adam, that humans are intrinsically connected to creation. And that, of course, we see that in our Christian story, but we also see that play out in science, that every time we take a breath, creation is inside of us. The other piece is justice. And so recognizing that to protect, to protect, preserve, and restore God's creation is not just fighting for protections for nature, but it's justice for God's planet and God's people. That the systems and structures that oppress people are the same logics of oppression that are used to oppress and extract the land. And I think this is, this is exactly what Pope Francis is getting at in Laudato Si when he writes the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. 
that these are intrinsically related and we cannot have liberation for the poor if we do not have liberation for the earth and vice versa. So that's what creation justice is about. To get a little um, nerdy in a theological sense, um, I often think about the three-part mission of creation justice ministries being protect, rightly share, and restore as the three E's. And that is protect being ecological, ensuring that the ecological processes of life are protected and that God's gift of nature and these wonderful natural, um, natural systems and cycles are protected. Rightly share. Of course, that's economic. We know that there is enough in this world for everyone, but it's a matter of sharing it rightly and creating that, that economy, uh, God's beloved economy for all. And then restore is eschatological. And by that, I mean, um, you know, what we are moving towards in the end. What is the end of this all, all of this? It's the recognition that all will be restored. And that as we work here, we can, we can be partners with God in the work of restoration. So now I'm going to shift a little bit and, and talk about Earth Day Sunday. Uh, 2022. So like I mentioned before, um, Creation Justice Ministries Earth Day Sunday theme this year is weathering the storm, faithful climate resilience. So I want to take a moment and tell a little bit of uh, the backstory about Creation Justice Ministries work on Earth Day. So ever since we were founded as the Eco Justice Program in the National Council of Churches, we have released Earth Day Sunday resources every year on a variety of different topics. Each year we choose a different theme and we pull together a guide that congregations can use to talk about that theme in their, in their congregation. Um, I'll go through the pieces of this resource later, um, but would invite you, uh, if you wanna explore our past resources, those are available on the resource hub on our website you can direct there from our website homepage, which is creationjustice.org. Uh, it's not that hard to get to our resource hub, but we have 20 or 30 Earth Day Sunday resources from last year. And the reason these are still relevant is that while they're called Earth Day Sunday resources, what we really want them to be used for is Earth Day Sunday and beyond. So a recognition that we don't just check the box on Earth Day and say, okay, you know, we talked about creation justice this day. We're good for the rest of the year. No, what we want Earth Day to be is a kickoff, you know, um, a reminder, uh, a moment to energize a community around care for God's creation and the work of creation justice. So Earth Day Sunday doesn't just, it doesn't need to be celebrated the Sunday after Earth Day. It doesn't need to be celebrated this week and it can be celebrated whenever and in fact, it should be celebrated on an ongoing basis um, in the rhythms of church life. So this year, our theme is weathering the storm, faithful climate resilience. And, you know, I think the last few years, it has become absolutely abundantly clear that climate change is here. That climate change is not something to prepare for 10, 20, 50 years in the future, but that climate change has arrived and it is impacting, often devastating our communities. And so what that means is that it's not an issue for the church to be preparing for in 10 or 20 years, that if the church is to be responsive to the needs of its community, it needs to be preparing and responding to the realities of climate change as they're unfolding among us right now. Because all around us, we don't have to look that far to see how God's people and God's planet are being impacted by the climate crisis. And the church has so much to offer 
Because as the world groans and travail, we know that the role of the church is to partner with God in cultivating a redeemed, a restored, a resilient creation. We know that the church can weather the storm and can help the communities, the places that we love weather the storm as well. So that's what weathering the storm is about. That's what faithful climate resilience is about. And this resource and this broader project at Creation Justice Ministries of Faithful Resilience is framed around this central question. How can our churches be hubs of resilience, helping our neighbors weather the physical and the spiritual storms of the climate crisis? So we know that wildfires and hurricanes and droughts and heat waves are not just having a physical impact on communities, but they are also having a spiritual impact on communities. We know that we are affected by the disruption of our lives, you know, whether it's being entirely displaced from the place that we love and the place we've lived and our family has lived for generations, whether it's seeing a park or a natural space that we love disappear or change because of climate change, all of these all of these factors, all of these things that we love that are changing around us, that is a spiritual storm that I think the church has the capacity to respond to. And then, of course, we know that there are physical needs that are coming up because of climate change, of people being displaced, of homes being destroyed, of creatures, not just humans, but other creatures being displaced and moving. And so how can churches be hubs of resilience? How can we make room for the thriving of other creatures, both human and non-human in the time of climate crisis? I also wanna take a moment and define resilience for us because right now resilience is, it's kind of one of these sexy words that gets thrown around a lot in environmental circles and, um, no one really knows what it means um, unless we're being clear in our definition. So the way that we use resilience at Creation Justice Ministries is that resilience is about bouncing forward, not just bouncing back. That when we're building resilience to climate change, we're not just creating systems that will, um, that will last climate change. We're, we're not just trying to Um, ensure that the existing systems will continue to serve us because we know that we're not. We know that those systems are not serving us. But that we will see the climate crisis as an invitation to create systems that will serve us, systems of democracy and justice. Um, And these are systems both in... um, in our church settings, the ways we organize and do church, but also the ways that we organize and participate in political processes. So resilience is bouncing forward, not just bouncing back, an active posture rather than just a passive one. Um, Secondly, resilience is not just one issue, that resilience involves social, physical, and spiritual factors playing together in concert, that we really do need Uh, We need to address all three, social, physical, and spiritual. Um, You know, recent recent studies have shown that the best predictor of a resilient community is one that has stronger social ties and stronger social networks. So we know that that's very needed. Um, We also know that there, you know, physical resilience is needed, that um, we need more living shorelines. We need... um, more rain gardens. We, we need physical infrastructure that is going to be able to absorb, um, absorb rising sea levels, that is going to be able to uh, prevent the intensifying wildfires from affecting our communities. And of course, I already talked about the spiritual piece of this. 
So this year, through our Earth Day Sunday theme, we invite you to consider how you and how your church are anticipating, preparing for, and bouncing forward into a just, sustainable, and resilient community. So when you look at your church, what are the particular assets that your church has that could be leveraged as a resilience hub in order to help your neighbors weather the physical and spiritual storms of the climate crisis? So for Earth Day Sunday in your church, and it doesn't have to be this weekend, it's not going to be this weekend, obviously, (laughs) you're not going to plan that, but you know, if, if there's a time when you do want to do a service based on um, these resources, uh, there are three pieces here, three simple ways to build an Earth Day Sunday at your church. Um, and I want to highlight those. Pray, preach, and discuss. So with pray, looking to the liturgy and worship resources that we're sharing in weather- Weathering the Storm, Preach, looking towards some of the Bible studies and sermon starters that we share in this resource. And then finally, discuss, offering some films and reflection questions to spur more imagination and discussion in your community. So this resource is available at earthdaysunday.org. It's available both as a download and as a Um, an online interactive resource. So you can engage in either way. Um, You can print it and share it with your community um, or you can share the website. I know that digital or analog is is better for different communities. So we wanted to offer it in both ways. Here's a few screenshots of what that resource looks like. It's about eight pages long. Um, It includes other resources beyond just pray, preach and discuss. As you can see here, there's also some stories of resilience that we share. Um, just different stories about how uh, churches have worked on building climate resilience in their communities. Uh, there's also action steps, ways that you can engage in the work of resilience at the personal community and public or advocacy level. So let's talk about prayer. So we know that the structure of our communal life lies in the heart of Christian worship that the ways we structure our worship life resonate beyond the walls of the sanctuary. So what we offer in this resource are a few different prayers that you can use to structure your communal prayer life and the worship of of, um, an Earth Day Sunday service. So you're invited to use the prayers and the liturgy as a way to begin integrating climate resilience into your worship service. So I didn't want to list out all of the prayers there, but but here's one that is in there, the call to worship. This is one that was written by Creation Justice Ministries. Others are adapted from other resources. But we'll actually pray this prayer together at the end, so I won't take too much time here. Uh, The second is preach and teach. So what we offer are sermon starters and, and Bible studies. And what we mean by sermon starters are um, a few recommended a few recommended texts that can be used um, for a sermon, and then some reflections on that text and a few questions. And what these are meant to do is serve as sparks to ignite the fire of a sermon or a Bible study. It's not a comprehensive curriculum. It's you know it's it's not outlining. Uh, everything that you should, every point that you should make in a sermon. But our hope is that it's, it's looking at a text through a different lens, you know, maybe a lens that you or your pastor have not looked at a text before, and that may spark something interesting in your mind, may um, open up questions or ideas or remind you of a story in your experience about climate resilience. Um, And that then you can build either a sermon or a Bible study session around that text. So one of those texts is Nehemiah 2, 17 through 18. And this is actually the text that I'll be preaching on this weekend for an Earth Day Sunday um, service uh, in Raleigh. And um, 
You know, it's kind of a strange one here. Of course, the story of Nehemiah is Nehemiah coming back to Jerusalem after the wall, about a hundred years after the wall has been destroyed and hearing a call from God to rebuild the wall. So it's a little bit of a strange time to be talking about building the wall as a faithful activity. So (laughs) of course, have to be careful around that. But I, I think the messages here in Nehemiah are really interesting when we think about them from a time of climate crisis and from a lens of uh, climate resilience. Because what Nehemiah does is he, he returns to Jerusalem and he looks around and he sees rubble. But he doesn't just see devastation. He sees through that rubble the possibilities for rebuilding from the rubble that is there in partnership with his community. There's a line here that says they stood shoulder to shoulder, each rebuilding the wall outside of his house, his or her house. And I think that's a really compelling vision for us right now that the resources for building climate resilience and for responding to the climate crisis are here, that we have what we need. But what it takes is a little bit of vision and creativity to use the resources that we have. And it takes community and organizing to come together with our neighbors to build something from the rubble. So Nehemiah can teach us something about climate change and the climate crisis. So that's, that's an example of one of the sermon starters. There's a few others in there. Um, encourage you to check those out. The next piece that I want to highlight is discussion. And uh, I'm actually going to start this by, by playing a short video. So Creation Justice Ministries produced two videos last summer called Faithful Resilience, one that tells stories from Georgia and one that tells stories from North Carolina about how coastal faith communities are being impacted by climate change and how they're building resilience as a response. So um, I'm gonna get this video going and um, we'll talk about the discussion questions afterwards. It's just about five minutes and I think you all are going to find it very compelling. Truth is a lonely place, but it is the only place. If we don't deal with truth, what you're going to end up having is the fiction that has brought us to the place to where democracy right now is in jeopardy. here on the coast are uh, black, indigenous, and people of color who are on the front line of the impact of climate change, uh, particularly here in Brunswick, where there is a tremendous amount of flooding that results from tropical storms, sea level rise, and they are experiencing these uh, impacts at alarming rates. September of last year, uh, and we had an unusual rainy day. Uh, and yes, we're on the coast, so high tide plus rain means flooding. And we probably had about maybe three feet of water that was just standing here in this area. And in light of what we experienced last year and what it cost us here, we decided that we want to do our part in trying to protect what we have here. And so we started boarding up the holes in which the water can infiltrate underneath the structure and put sandbags up. And so it's, if we can't have the structures in place that will protect us, we have to protect ourselves. But everybody can't afford sandbags. Everybody can't afford to always move away or protect themselves when flooding happens. Some people have lived in this, in this particular city all their lives can't afford to go anywhere else. And they can barely afford to stay where they are. 
and those are the people who really need the funding to come in to improve the area and the conditions in which they live. This is where these winding roads have led. I don't think that people even recognize that climate change is a spiritual destruction and we have transferred faith into fear. If you ain't got no courage, you ain't got no faith. And if you ain't got no faith, you ain't got no God. And that's what's done happened to us. Churches have dug real deep into their coffers and are meeting the needs of communities that are being impacted by climate change. I think that the federal government should be also investing in robust, rich, bold economic recovery as well as infrastructure. This will be the day. sort of take a step back and pause for a minute to say, but what is it costing us in the future? But if we are to walk in the path that Jesus has set before us, perhaps we should let the idea of scarcity, we shouldn't let it stop us so easily. Um, as I referenced in my sermon today that God can do amazing things with just a little bit, but we have to do our part as well thinking that we don't have the time or the money or the energy might be self-limiting when we actually have access to much more than we can ever imagine. I will stay strong, never giving up faith. I will go on, go on the way. This will be the day. So that's one of two films that we produced last summer. The other one is, is stories from North Carolina. Um, and these are, these are publicly available. We want you to be screening these in your churches, in your small groups, wherever you can. Um, because as you just saw, these are powerful stories and a powerful way to see how, not only how climate change is affecting communities, but how communities of faith are proactively serving as hubs of climate resilience. So along with that film, we have a few discussion questions that you can use uh, if you do decide to do a screening uh, of the film. Truth. Sorry about that. So again, just uh, in, in summary, I guess, um, all of these resources are available at earthdaysunday.org. You can download the resource there. You can engage with it um, uh, in an online setting and, and encourage you to go there and just read through the resource. Um, it's really helpful. Um, and, you know, as you think about how you might do an Earth Day Sunday service in your congregation, uh, there's a lot of helpful guidance therein. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't share a few other excellent resources for this season. Um, as you know, right now, I guess we're, we're sort of on, on the back end of this, but uh, the last month has been the convergence of sacred seasons for Christianity and Judaism and uh, Islam. And so there's been some, some really excellent sacred season for climate justice resources put together by Green Faith. Um, Faith Climate Action Week by Interfaith Power and Light is happening right now, and they have some great resources for engaging in your congregation. Exodus Alliance is a multi-faith campaign um, that's do doing some climate justice work. Uh, and then um, a podcast that I've been able to be a part of recently, which is the Green Lectionary podcast. Um, we have been looking at uh, the lectionary texts from uh, with a green lens. And so talking about how you might be able to preach or teach the lectionary 
with an eye towards creation and climate justice. Um, that podcast is a part of the Food and Faith podcast. So I think if you search either Green Lectionary podcast or Food and Faith podcast, you'll find that. Um, I can also send all of these links out later. I don't have them with me right now. I apologize for that, but I can send them later. Uh, and then finally, we um, just last month hosted a program called Preaching Resilience, Cultivating Climate Justice from the Pulpit. Um, and that recording is available at youtube.com slash creation justice ministries alongside um, the last year and a half of webinars from our faithful resilience program, looking at climate resilience from a number of different lenses. Tomorrow, we are hosting an ecumenical Earth Day service at noon Eastern Standard Time. You can register for this um, at if you go to our homepage, you can find the registration link. It's also available here. Again, that's a link that I, I can send out later. Um, it's sort of a long link, sorry about that. Um, but this, this graphic is on our homepage as well. So you can, you can find the URL there. But we'll have just a short service of prayer and song tomorrow with a short homily from one of our, our the leaders in our community. And it should be a nice time to, rep, to worship alongside siblings from across the Christian tradition. I also wanted to share some information about an upcoming in-person workshop that Creation Justice Ministries is hosting called Pastoral Care for Climate, Weaving Science and Theology for Justice. This is in collaboration with the uh, Duke University Marine Lab and the Center for Climate Solutions. Um, this is a free training for pastors and ministry leaders to think about what it means to lead, um, lead a Christian congregation or organization in a time of climate change. So this is June 13th through 15th. The application form and more information is at creationjustice.org slash NC workshop. So if you are a minister or a, a ministry leader, or if there's someone in your community who is, who would be interested in this, please share this opportunity with them. So thanks for letting me do some advertisements there. Um, but I want to end our time here in the plenary with the prayer that you saw earlier. So please join me in this closing prayer. Like Job in the whirlwind, or Jonah in the storm at sea, we come before you in awe of your power, God. We recognize that today's storms and whirlwinds are not your judgment on your people, but the distortion of natural systems through our own sin and hubris. As the storms and whirlwinds of the climate crisis accelerate around us, may our sanctuaries be a place of refuge and resilience where all of God's creation might be protected and sustained and from which we, people of God, might be sent forth to bring healing and justice. Amen. Thanks again for inviting me in to this space, everyone. It's been a gift to, to be with you. Here's my information here. I'll leave this up for a moment um, as we transition into a time of Q&A. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Avery. Uh, you'll hang out for a few minutes. We're going to break out into rooms and have some small group discussion. So we want to give everybody here a chance to talk. We're going to, as I mentioned, break into groups for about 15 minutes. And Susan's going to post uh, some questions in the chat so that uh, we can talk together about Avery's presentation. So when we do break out, may I suggest that you introduce yourself, uh, maybe tell folks where you're calling in from, and then jump right into the questions. So as soon as I stop talking, Susan's going to send you an invitation to join a breakout room. Just click accept and then um, join with others, share some wisdom. And we'll reconvene in 15 minutes or so for some Q&A time with Avery. So welcome back, folks. I hope.
Hope your conversations were helpful and stimulating. And uh, now is the time if, if you have a question that you'd like to direct. In fact, uh, I'm going to actually um, change up a little bit here, Avery, if it's okay with you. I think we'll just, um, Susan, if you don't mind, let's just uh, let any, everybody unmute themselves and ask their questions verbally instead of going through the chat since we're a smaller group tonight. Uh, so, um, Susan, if you'd unmute, uh, let people unmute themselves and we'll just take whatever questions. I'll get it started because somebody actually posed a question, Avery, before we went into the breakout rooms. Um, Terry wrote, um, in California, we have a drought, but people seem unconcerned. May maybe they're not seeing the church as a place to talk about climate problems. How do we start to raise people's awareness that we should get involved as a church? What what's the... What are the best starting points? Maybe that's the question here is best practices about starting to conscientize a, a, a congregation. Can you help us out? Yeah, yeah. I think um, find opportunities for people to see firsthand what's going on. Um, and so, you know, I think with a drought, you know, perhaps it's taking, you know, a pilgrimage, you know, frame it as a pilgrimage out to the reservoir to um, see it, to lament it. You know, we have rituals of lament in our tradition, right? To, to kind of incorporate those and frame it as, as a spiritual issue, what's going on. Um, or if it's too far of a drive, you know, have photos, um, you know, tell the stories of people who are directly affected, you know, maybe find a video or something like we shared here. I would imagine there's, you know, maybe some environmental organizations who have created videos about that screen those, just ways to make it material for people, right? Because when we turn on our faucet and water comes out, you know, it's so easy to think that we have a drought or, you know, from my time in California, when the, you know, our lawn is green and <laughs> everything looks fine here, um, it's hard to make the connection. So as, as much as you can find ways either in person or through digital media to make those connections, that's a starting place. And then secondly, find ways to engage in rituals around that, especially rituals of lament. And Avery, my experience, let me ask you just a, kind of a follow-up question. My experience is it's, it's nice doing those kind of pilgrimages or immersion experiences or whatever you want to call them, to have somebody with some knowledge sort of midwifing the experience for you so that you, they're interpreting what you're seeing and helping you understand the historical uh, it, you know, the history of why this is doing what it's doing. Is that your experience as well? Oh yeah. That's great, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't have to be a faith group really. I think, you know, if you find a local environmental organization who's working on water issues, I guarantee you they would love to go out with your faith group and would love to make space for you to, you know, do prayer and whatever else. And they can provide more of the, the kind of scientific or historical content. And then, um, uh, let me ask one other question uh, if, um, from before we get, um, uh, went into the breakout rooms. Um, Avery, can you give us maybe in a in thumbnail uh, uh, scale uh, some other examples of how uh, you imagine or how churches are actually doing the work of resilience already? Just some just some snapshots, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just share a few a few snapshots. The longer stories are in the resource, you can read more, but um, there's an Episcopal church in Annapolis that has a, a piece of land right along the Chesapeake Bay. Not, not big, maybe four acres. Um, and they restored a wetland that had been turned into a storm drain pipe. That they, they restored the wetland on their property so that as the sea levels rise, um, their, their property is able to absorb the water that God's creation is so amazing that when you restore it, it's actually able to absorb the rising waters. That's one example. Um, another one is a church in Charleston, South Carolina. that got flooded that year back to back to back from hurricanes. And so they, they commissioned a hydrological study of their neighborhood to assess what was going on and found out that not only was, you know, um, were there intensifying hurricanes because of climate change, but there is, unsustainable development upstream, too much paving, too much concrete, essentially. And that meant that all of that rain was ending up in the houses of their neighbors. And so they got involved in local politics. 
to change zoning laws, basically, to protect their neighborhood. So just a few examples of, of ways to get involved. What I love about those two is they're two very different uh, congregations with two very different kinds of assets, but both seeing what their assets are and using to, them to address problems that are, ha that are happening in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Avery, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, uh, but um, one, one of our, uh, uh, Carol actually writes, um, how many bishops and pastors, and I guess we could expand that beyond the Catholic world, but how many bishops and pastors are fully engaged in the Laudato Si and Care for Creation message? It, it, what, what's your experience been? I'm, I'm guessing, and I am guessing here, that the question comes out of some concern that not a whole lot of bishops have seemed to have been, seem to be terribly in, invested in, in the Laudato Si project. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I we work in, in mostly Protestant settings. Of course, we collaborate ecumenically with with Catholic partners, but um, I think that that's what I've seen in my experience as well. That um, Laudato Si is not really um, trickling down, as it were. Um, but you know, we we see the same thing, you know, really with with our congregations and our denominations as well. We work with thirty eight denominations, so they're all at the table. Um, but the difficulty that we face is how do we make sure um, that, you know, these are sort of, these messages are being implemented on the ground. And, um, that's, that's a code that I've not yet cracked yet. So you all are not alone in that struggle. And I think we, it's, we can work together on that. Uh, well, Avery, my wife is yelling from the next room that I'm talking too much and not letting anybody else ask questions. <laughs> I'm just going to be quiet <laughs> and let somebody else ask a question. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, I, my name is Marianne, and I'd like to respond to um, um, Avery. Uh, there, um, I think I was uh, on a, um, a webinar yesterday when I heard that less than 1% of our bishops are truly involved mm. in uh, the environment, in mm. environmental issues. They look at other issues. Uh, but not the environmental issues. And so that is a real problem. Uh, so uh, I think there's an article written uh, someplace uh, which reviews uh, or really uh, talks about that. And I don't, I didn't get the article. Uh, so uh, that might be a good place to start. Yeah, thanks, one. Marianne. Yeah, thanks, Marion. And, you know, one, one piece that I can offer here is um, what, what seems to be a success story as, as what I've seen is um, the new Archbishop of Washington and Washington, D.C., really implementing Laudato Si well. And then in Maryland as well, I know the Maryland Catholic Conference was involved in advocating for 100 percent clean energy legislation this year. So maybe it's worth reaching out to some some folks who are engaged in those networks and um, just learn, I guess, just asking them, you know, how did you do this? You know, were there particular levers that you you pressed or pulled? Uh, how did you get to this point? Might, might provide some, some helpful lessons and a case study to learn from. Also um, uh, mentioning that uh, a lot of the universities are divesting um, from fuel, they have a, a, a period of time in which they will be, will be totally divested, uh, and it really uh, involves student involvement, mm -hmm. and students are very much involved in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Avery, if you don't mind, I'm going to pull in one, one of our uh, listeners tonight, Russ Testa. It's good to see your face. I'm wondering, Russ, if you could give us any insight in, into how bishops have been engaged in the Laudato Si, given your work? Yeah, a um, couple of things. To answer specifically about Washington, D.C. and um, Maryland, because um, we're a part of St. Camillus is a parish in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., just outside of uh, uh, Maryland. It's taken, it took us eight years, uh, basically. That's where I think of resilience, you know, of basically going to the Catholic conference in Maryland and just constantly, constantly doing, you know, bringing this up as an issue. Um, 
and bringing it up and bringing people. I mean, showing up for their their advocacy nights um, and then reminding them that we also want to talk about environmental issues as well. The other piece I think is really important is, um, excuse me, um, that um, the other part I think is really important is that we found is that we really reached out and made strong partnerships with the Spanish language community. Spanish is the first language community. They're open to working on environmental issues, whereas frankly, white Catholics are not. I mean, we, we complain about 1% of our bishops doing this, but frankly, about 1% of our Catholics are probably into this as well, um, at least the white Catholics. I mean, I don't wanna be all racial justice stuff, but um, uh, we've got to call ourselves into kind of accountability. Um, and I think we're here, we don't have to go, we're doing, we're, but how do we reach out to others, invite others in a kind of welcoming way? And I think that's the other piece is that, I think as we look at Laudato C, we found this in the Franciscan world I work within, that uh, we can't wait for our bishops, we can't wait for our pastors necessarily. Um, they'll come along uh, when you've got enough people. Um, they're, they're politicians listening to the wind as well, um, like others. And so if we can make that kind of wind to change, we've got to do that. That's hard to do. Um, the other piece we've been very successful with, I think, is we've made some very deliberate choices and have been controversial uh, but we're partnering very closely with groups like Sunrise Movement and other groups of young people um, mm -hmm. to kind of make those connections that may not be coming from a faith perspective. And they may be coming from stuff that's very radical, um, but they've actually come from a place that actually a lot of them come from faith backgrounds. And they're kind of looking for places to be able to like, live that out. And mm -hmm. I think they're looking for the church to do that. Well, we are the church. We can do that. So um, I'll, I'll stop now. I don't want to be. I don't want your wife yelling at me either, Jack, for talking too much. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, those are some things just that I we have found kind of helpful um, in kind of our work and kind of do this. And the only thing I would say that in our small group, the one thing I just wanted to I didn't get a chance to say is, but a lot of groups are working on gardening and garden groups. I just want to encourage you more and more to do that, to have that real tangible touch with the earth. Um, I think that's helpful from a spiritual point of view. Um, as a recovering farmer, um, our lease just ended in our farm. Um, so, but the other piece of it that's going to be so important is um, basically within two months, I was working with some other folks and uh, a number of our food pantries, the world's going to have about, only going to be able to produce about 78% of the calories we need in the world. Um, so there's going to be a lot of hunger because of the war in Ukraine. And how are we at least going to deal with some of those food issues in our own local communities? And these local gardens are going to be an important and incredible piece of that. So I just can't encourage that enough. So. Well, Russ, I said I didn't I didn't catch you off guard with nothing to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was wonderful. Yeah, appreciate that. Now, Trudy. Um, I just wanted to share that I'm aware that there are three uh, archdioceses or dioceses that have published their Laudato Si action platform, and that is Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and uh, San Diego. And I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, and we did a Catholic conference a year ago, and we had two really wonderful talks, um, keynote addresses from uh, Bishop Stowe and Bishop McElroy. Um, they were really dynamic and really strong. And so we know that there are at least one, two, three, four, Five. five bishops <laughs> um, or archbishops and soupage from uh, Chicago. Yes. So that's six. So I think that's, well, I don't know how many bishops there are. So I don't know what percent that is, but mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by those who are speaking out. So I'm, I'm meeting with the bishop on Monday, a group of us. And um, so we're hoping Sacramento is going to be added to this list. I thank you for this information because I'm going to put that out um, to Bishop Soto that we want to be in the forefront and it'll bring attention to our diocese. So thank you so much, uh, Trudy, for this information. And you can download those documents so you could take an example Right. And we have, we've seen the San Diego one. We're trying to get a convening um, so we can put it into action in every parish within the Diocese of Sacramento. So um, we're, we're, we're hoping we have really high hopes for this meeting on Monday. So we've been working on it uh, for a long time. So, um, but thank you. 
Oh, well, great. I would love to talk with you about that because uh, the Madison Diocese is very slow on us. So. Yes, uh, Jim, well, uh, Jim Borelli and Bride, or sister or friend. I wrote in the chat a question. Uh, would everyone be willing to share email addresses with one another so we could continue to collaborate? I'm fine with that. I can put my email in there. Um, or if someone has all the emails, if you could just send out one document to all of us. Yeah, we, we typically we don't do that because we typically can't get everybody's uh, yes on that. But um, if I'll, I'll just look at nodding heads right now and yeah. if it's okay with folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, saying no. Um, okay. Uh, then I, I'll include everybody, but uh, just a couple of folks who nodded no. And I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Uh, any other comments or questions? We're getting close to the end here. I yes, Terry. Appreciate you doing oh, this, Jack. I thank you very much for doing this, and thank you, um, Avery. Great presentation. I have one question. Terry, you, oh. Yes, Carol. Mm -hmm. me, and then we'll go to Terry. I was, um, I, um, I was wondering how many uh, churches from, or you know, or. Um, is implementing having a prayer about creation within their intentional prayers on a regular basis. Um, I'm actually writing them each week. Um, actually, we're doing it. Every, we started every week, and then I didn't want people to go negative on me, so we're doing it twice, uh, two Sundays every month. But I was just curious if any oh. other parishes or uh, you know are doing anything such as that. Well, they're a part of the prayers of the faithful in our church. They, so they are including about that. Yeah. Right? Many churches, mm -hmm. many Catholic churches. Anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's not uncommon. Uh, Carol, yeah. But that would be my experience. Anyway, I was going to ask Avery, um, you know, most of us participated in what I think is called the Synod. And there were meetings that were held at uh, different churches. And lots of good, uh, what shall I say, suggestions came up as to how we should uh, be as community, as church. And I'm wondering if, uh, if that's something that uh, maybe your group can take advantage of, the fact that every church has to have them. And um, no. I don't know, <laughs> maybe something we can latch on to. Yeah, that's, I would love to learn more. I'm not familiar with this, Terry, but it, I mean. Oh, it came from Pope Francis and... Uh, all the Catholic churches had to hold a synod that had questions for the future and questions for the present. Mm. It had to do where you're going, um, where you're going in your parish. So yeah. I just thought you were familiar with it. Terry, unfortunately, uh, too many bishops uh, in the country did not encourage or actively discourage participation in that. I was really? co-chair of the Synodality Project uh, in our parish and the Richmond Diocese was very active in that. I'd like to see them get more active in the Laudato Si as well. So you're saying they're all over the country? I never heard of any parish, in, at least in California. People, people had them, they had those meetings. Well, I go out to the Franciscan Renewal Center in Scottsdale, Arizona, and the Bishop of Phoenix gave very, uh, he had to promote it because that was part of his job, but he didn't really uh, encourage his uh, congregations to participate. Let me close this for now, just because we are a little over time, and um, I want to have a few business items, and then we'll close with prayer. Before I do that, though, can we all just sort of give Avery a, a, a clap uh, for his time and uh, effort tonight? We deeply appreciate what you had to say, Avery. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you again for the partnership that Just Faith Ministries enjoys with you. It's a pleasure to work with you. Thanks, Jack. Um, just to remind you all again that next week, uh, Leela will be sending an email to all of you with a, the video link to Avery's presentation. Avery, if there are any other links that you would like us to include in that email, uh, you can send them to me and I'll be glad to include them. I'll also get email addresses to those of you who requested them. 
In that email, by the way, there'll be an invitation for those of you who don't uh, aren't currently members of the Just Faith Network to join. We have uh, a, an interesting slate of offerings scheduled for the rest of this year, so be sure to check out what's happening in the Just Faith Network and join today if you're not already a member. And now I'll, I'll take out my little begging bowl for a second. Three quarters of our operating budget is provided by the generosity of folks like you who participate in a program or an event. Uh, so tonight's presentation was free. That's just the way we like it, but we wanna invite you to partner with us to continue to offer opportunities like this to the world. So your gift is a gift to the world. And finally, I'd like to invite you to next month's Acting for Justice event on Thursday, May, that's the wrong date. Let's see, it's May 19th. Um, as Alicia Brewster and Michael Brown, environmental justice advocates in South Carolina, address the topic racial equity in the clean energy transition. So please join us then. I'll close our time together with a very short prayer. Let us pray. God of peace and God of justice, when we can't imagine a happy ending to the chaos, we pray for a more powerful imagination. When we can't figure out what to do, let us pray for those who can. When our prayer seems to be without hope, let us pray nevertheless. And when the moment comes for us to act, and that moment has come, we pray that we will. Amen. Amen. Thanks everybody again for being with us. God bless. We'll see you next month, I hope. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.